everyone. Good morning. We are at Basket Elementary with these awesome second graders. And today for Science with Sarah, we're making magnetic spiders in theme with Halloween. And we say... Good morning, San Antonio! Look around for a fun experiment! Woo! Woo! Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Good morning, everybody. We've made it to Wednesday. It is October 18th, and we're bringing talkers back. That's right. Uh, we're going to check in with Sarah in a little bit. I can't wait to see her cute little experiment. Okay, talk to most folks, and a lot of people traveled this year. Uh, tra air travel is back in a big way. It's now beaten pre-pandemic levels, and one of the most stressful things I think a lot of people would agree is the boarding process. Yeah, it can get a little, um, I guess, crowded, you mm -hmm. know, and especially on those full flights, you know, putting your luggage away and everything like that. But so uh, United Airlines, they're looking to reintroduce window seat first boarding. That's right. So um, if you, so the log jam, yeah, so United knows that the conundrum all too well. So it's introducing a new boarding process to help in economy people with window seats will now board first on United, followed by those in the middle seat and then the aisle seat. They actually call it Wilma for window, middle, aisle. Aisle, yes. okay, yeah. yes. And then the airline says a system similar to one it had uh, until 2017, but with more nuances. So more the, nuances. Yeah, the yes. new process allows pre-boarding, award tier and higher seat class customers to go first. Basic economy passengers will still board last. Uh, United says they're, uh, they've already tested this out in some markets and they're, they're, they're okay with it. They're gonna start this process coming up uh, next week, October 26th. Yeah, I can see how that could be a little helpful. Um, now, I, I did some research. Uh -huh. United is saying they're going to save two minutes per flight on boarding this way. Hmm. And that doesn't sound like a lot, right? But no. you start to add those up, especially at an airport like Houston Intercontinental. Right. They're going to save hours in the long run. Yeah, I'm sure it won't all go perfectly but <laughs> well people are already confused about which seat they're in when they actually get on board once yeah. you get you with your luggage so we'll see how this goes it'll be yeah, interesting it will be interesting yeah i was like pardon me i'm in the i'm in the middle seat <laughs> you are oh, i thought i was on the window oh, you know how gosh. that whole thing goes yeah, yeah yeah there'll still be a little bit of that Okay, okay, right now we are going to check in with justin we're standing by for a special report from abc news which could happen oh okay it's actually happening right now. So obviously everybody's aware of the situation in the Middle East. President Joe Biden is there. He has been meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And we are awaiting a, a network update from ABC News on the president's visit. Israel and Hamas from turning into a much wider conflict here. The president also meeting with the families of victims and first responders just a short time ago. A second planned meeting with Arab leaders in Jordan on this same trip was canceled after the explosion at that hospital in Gaza. Of course, the horrendous scene there, uh, killing at least 500 people. Both the Palestinians and Israelis blaming each other for that blast. Meanwhile, there have been protests in support of the Palestinians across the region. You're looking right now at pictures uh, coming into ABC just moments ago. This is outside the U.S. Embassy uh, in Beirut. You can see protesters there uh, demonstrating again in support of the Palestinians. The Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah calling for another day of rage, specifically targeting the U.S. And we should mention at this hour that here in this country, security remains on high alert in several major cities across the U.S. President Biden is now hoping to head off a wider war that, of course, always runs the risk of drawing in Hezbollah to the north in Lebanon and in Iran, while also trying to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza with hundreds of thousands of people already displaced. You can see that is the room in Israel where the president is expected to speak just moments from now. Again, meeting a short time ago with families of victims in Israel. I want to bring in our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, who is standing by in Tel Aviv. No question, uh, this trip is a bit of a tightrope for the president. And Martha, you and I have been on the air so many times when a president has made a trip to a war zone, but usually it's done in secrecy. This one very much out in the open on the world stage, and it does come with risk. 
It, it certainly does, David. And we're standing here in Tel Aviv. There's a helicopter overhead. The, the streets are closed off below me. You can see police officers lined up and military as well because of the security here. I can't really ever remember a president going into a war zone, a conflict zone, so publicly announcing uh, days before that he would be coming to Israel. But the president thinks this is such an important trip. And he is trying, as you say, to walk that fine line, that tightrope to support Israel, the right to defend itself, but take into consideration the plight of the innocent Palestinian people inside Gaza. And I think that is the message he gave uh, to Benjamin Netanyahu today, that they have to consider that. Uh, they're about to launch a ground war, uh, according to the Israelis. What kind of ground war they do, I think, will depend on things they have heard from Joe Biden, and that truly was the message. But not having those meetings with Arab leaders, uh, Muslim leaders, is so important because you have seen those scenes. They need, President Biden, the Israelis, they need the help from Arab leaders to calm this part of the world down. That hospital explosion, uh, no matter what, no matter what the Israelis say, you will hear from people who will not believe them. So they do need, in that part of the world, to hear from their leaders to try to calm this situation down, David. You have covered this conflict for uh, many decades now, Martha, dare I say, and as we keep our eye on this camera where the president is set to speak, uh, I'm curious what you make of these images coming in just moments ago from Beirut, uh, just alarming uh, pictures of protesters outside the U.S. Embassy there. Yeah, they're incredible pictures, and we were watching those images just a short time ago. It looks like uh, you have some from the Lebanese military throwing flashbang grenades at protesters. That is the U.S. Embassy. They're outside the U.S. Embassy. And David, as you know well, we do have to keep in mind what happened here in Israel. You saw it up close. I saw it up close. It was a horrendous attack by Hamas. But things have really spiraled out of control. And those images from Lebanon show you how bad this could get. Martha, stick with us here. We are about two minutes away from President Biden addressing uh, uh, the world uh, from Israel on this trip to Israel. I want to bring in Ian panel for a, a quick thought here, Ian. You heard Martha talk about uh, the, just the devastating images coming in out of Gaza at that hospital. Of course, both sides uh, pointing uh, to the other. Uh, but there are early images from that site. And again, we don't know. All we know is what President Biden said today. He's basing uh, what he said earlier today, which is that he believes it's at the hands of Hamas based on what he has been shown by his own defense team. Uh, but in the meantime, what can we discern, if anything, from some of the images that have now emerged from the site? Yeah, David, I think what we need to be very clear on is we don't know who carried out this attack. Uh, both sides, as you say, are accusing each other. What we can say, though, is it looks very different from all those other attacks, those thousands of attacks that we've seen inside Gaza. All the hallmarks are not necessarily of a direct strike. And this is something the Israelis were pointing out to me this morning, was that they say it comes from the propellant from a rocket, and it isn't, hasn't got the hallmarks of an Israeli airstrike. In other words, there's no crater. There's no impact crater. You see a large area that's blackened, which indicates that there's been something burning there at, at a very great heat. So you see all the, bar, all the cars are burned out. And the buildings around there's no obvious structural damage which again we've seen time and time again so that does raise some questions about exactly what's happened david ian panel with us as well president biden now entering the room again in israel having met with families uh, just moments ago let's listen to the president <clears throat> please have a seat i come to israel with a single message you're not alone you are not alone as long as the United States stands and we will stand forever, we'll not let you ever be alone. Most importantly, the, uh, I know the recent terrorist assault on the people of this nation has left a deep, deep wound. More than 1,300 innocent Israelis killed, including at least 31 American citizens by the terrorist group Hamas. Hundreds, hundreds of young people at a music festival the festival was for peace, for peace, gunned down as they ran for their lives. Scores of innocents, from infants to elderly grandparents, Israelis and Americans, taken hostage. 
children slaughtered, babies slaughtered, entire families massacred, rape, beheadings, bodies burned alive. Hamas committed atrocities that recall the worst ravages of ISIS, unleashing pure, unadulterated evil upon the world. There's no rationalizing it, no excusing it, period. The brutality we saw would have cut deep anywhere in the world, but it cuts deeper here in Israel. October 7th, which was sacred to a sacred Jewish holiday, became the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. It has brought to the surface painful memories and scars left by millennia of anti-Semitism and the genocide of the Jewish people. The world watched then. It knew and the world did nothing. We will not stand by and do nothing again. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. To those who are living in limbo, waiting desperately to learn the fate of a loved one, especially to families of the hostages, you're not alone. We're working with partners throughout the region, pursuing every avenue to bring home those who are being held captive by Hamas. I can't speak publicly about all the details, but let me assure you, for me, as the American president, there's no higher priority than the release and safe return of all these hostages. To those who are grieving, a child, a parent, a spouse, a sibling, a friend, I know you feel like there's that black hole in the middle of your chest. You feel like you're being sucked into it. The survivor's remorse, the anger, the questions of faith in your soul. Starting at staring at that empty chair, sitting Shiva, the first Sabbath without them. They're the everyday things, the small things that you miss the most. The scent when you open the closet door. The morning coffee you shared together. The bend of his smile, the perfect picture of a laugh. The giggle of your little boy, the baby. For those who have lost loved ones, this is what I know. They'll never be truly gone. There's something that's never fully lost. Your love for them and their love for you. And I promise you, you'll be walking along some days and say, what would she or he want me to do? You smile when you pass a place that reminds you of them. That's when you know. When a smile comes to your lips before a tear to your eye, that's when you know you're going to fully make it. That's what will give you the fortitude to find light in the darkest hours when terrorists believe they could bring down, bring you down, bend your will, break your resolve. But they never did and they never will. Instead, we saw incredible stories of heroism and courage. Israelis taking care of one another. Neighbors forming watch groups to protect their kibbutz. Opening their homes to shelter survivors. Retired soldiers running into danger once again. Civilian medics flying across rescue, flying rescue missions and off-duty medics at the music festival caring for the wounded before becoming, victim, before becoming a victim himself. Volunteers retrieving bodies of the dead so families could bury their loved ones in accordance with Jewish tradition. Reservists leaving behind their families, their honeymoons, their studies abroad, without hesitation, and so much more. The State of Israel was born to be a safe place for the Jewish people of the world. That's why I was born. I've long said, if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. And while it may not feel that way today, Israel must again be a safe place for the Jewish people. And I promise you, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that it will be. 75 years ago, just 11 minutes after its founding, President Harry S. Truman and the United States of America became the first nation to recognize Israel. We've stood by your side ever since. We're going to stand by your side now. My administration was in close touch with your leadership from the first moments of this attack. We're going to make sure we have what you have what you need to protect your people, to defend your nation. For decades, we've ensured Israel's qualitative military edge. And later this week, I'm going to ask the United States Congress for an unprecedented support package for Israel's defense. 
We're going to keep Iron Dome fully supplied so we can continue standing sentinel over Israeli skies, saving Israeli lives. We've moved U.S. military assets to the region, including positioning the USS Ford Carrier Strike Group in the eastern Mediterranean, with the USS Eisenhower on the way to deter, to defer further aggression against Israel, and to prevent this conflict from spreading. The world will know that Israel is, str Israel is stronger than ever. And my message to any state or any other hostile actor, thinking about attacking Israel remains the same as it was a week ago. Don't. 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 Since this terrorist attack, terrorist attack took place, we've seen it described as Israel's 9-11. But for a nation the size of Israel, it was like 15 9-11s. The scale may be different, but I'm sure those horrors have tapped into so, some kind of primal feeling in Israel, just like it did and felt in the United States. Shock, pain, rage, an all-consuming rage. I understand, and many Americans understand. You can't look at what has happened here to your mothers, your fathers, your grandparents, sons, daughters, children, even babies, and not scream out for justice. Justice must be done. But I caution this while you feel that rage. Don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. I'm the first U.S. president to visit Israel in time of war. I've made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. There's always cost, but it requires being deliberate. It requires asking very hard questions. It requires clarity about the objectives and an honest assessment about whether the path you're on will achieve those objectives. <clears throat> the vast majority of Palestinians are not Hamas. Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. Hamas uses innocence, innocent families, in Gaza as human shields, putting their command centers, their weapons, their communications tunnels in residential areas. Palestinian people are suffering greatly as well. We mourn the loss of innocent Palestinian lives like the entire world. I was outraged and saddened by the enormous loss of life yesterday in the hospital in Gaza. Based on the information we've seen to date, it appears the result of an errant rocket fired by a terrorist group in Gaza. The United States unequivocally stands for the protection of civilian life during conflict. And I grieve, I truly grieve for the families who were killed or wounded by this tragedy. The <clears throat> people of Gaza need food, water, medicine, shelter. Today, I asked the Israeli cabinet, who I met with for some time this morning, to agree to the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza, based on the understanding that there will be inspections, that the aid should go to civilians, not to Hamas. Israel agreed the humanitarian assistance can begin to move from Egypt to Gaza. But let me be clear. <clears throat> if Hamas diverts or steals the assistance, they will have demonstrated once again that they have no concern for the welfare of the Palestinian people. And it will end. <clears throat> As a practical matter, it will, it will stop the international community from being able to provide this aid. <clears throat> We're working in close cooperation with the government of Egypt, the United Nations, and its agencies like the World Food Program and other partners in the region to get trucks moving across the border as soon as possible. Separately, I ask Israel that the global community demand that the International Red Cross be able to visit hostages. I just demanded that the United States fully — a just demand that the United States fully supports. Today, I'm also announcing $100 million in new U.S. funding for humanitarian assistance in both Gaza and the West Bank. This money will support more than 1 million displaced and conflict-affected Palestinians, including emergency needs in Gaza. You are a Jewish state. You are a Jewish state, but you're also a democracy. And like the United States, you don't live by the rules of terrorists. You live by the rule of law. When conflicts flare, you live by the law of wars. What sets us apart from the terrorists 
as we believe in the fundamental dignity of every human life. Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, Jew, Muslim, Christian, everyone. You can't give up what makes you who you are. If you give that up, then the terrorists win, and we can never let them win. You know, Israel's a miracle, a triumph of faith and resolve and resilience over impossible pain and loss. Think about October 7th, the Jewish holiday, where you read about the death of Moses, <clears throat> a tragic story of a profound loss to an entire nation, a death that could have left a helpless hopelessness in the hearts of the entire of an entire nation. But though Moses died, his memory, his message, his lessons have lived on for generations of the Jewish people as well as many others. And just as the memory of your loved ones will live on as well. After reading the story of Moses' death, those who observed the holiday began reading the Torah from the very beginning. The story of creation reminds us of two things. First, that when we get knocked down, we get back up again, and we begin anew. And second, when we're faced with tragedy and loss, we must go back to the beginning and remember who we are. We are all human beings creating an image of God with dignity, humanity, and purpose. In the darkness, to be the light unto the world is what we're about. You inspire hope and light for so many around the world. That's what the terrorists seek to destroy. That's what they seek to destroy. Because they live in darkness, but not you, not Israel. Nations of conscience, like the United States and Israel, are not measured solely by the example of power, and we're measured by the power of our example. <clears throat> That's why, as hard as it is, we must keep pursuing peace. We must keep pursuing a path so that Israel and the Palestinian people can both live safely, in security, in dignity, and in peace. For me, that means a two-state solution. We must keep working for Israel's greater integration with its neighbors. These attacks have only strengthened my commitment and determination and my will to get that done. I'm here to tell you, the terrorists will not win. Freedom will win. So let me end where I began. <clears throat> Israel, you're not alone. The United States stands with you. I told the story before, and I'll tell it again, of my first meeting with an Israeli prime minister 50 years ago as a young senator. I was sitting across from Golda Meir at her desk in her office. And she had a guy named, a guy who later became prime minister, sitting next to me, just before the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And she flipped the maps up and down, t telling me how bad things were and how terrible they were. All of a sudden, she looked at me and she said, would you like a photograph? I looked at her. She got up from her desk and walked out into that hallway. I think it's marble flooring. Walked out in the hallway. We walked out, and there were a bunch of photographers standing in front of us. We were standing shoulder to shoulder. Without her looking at me, she said to me, knowing I'd hear her, why do you look so worried, Senator Biden? And I said, worried? Like, of course I'm worried. And she looked at me, and she didn't look. She said, we don't worry, Senator. We Israelis have a secret weapon. We have nowhere else to go. Well, today, I say to all of Israel, the United States isn't going anywhere either. We're going to stand with you. We'll walk beside you in those dark days. And we'll walk beside you in the good days to come. And they will come. As you say in Hebrew, which I'm not going to attempt to do because I'm such a terrible linguist, I'll say it in English, the people of Israel live. The people of Israel live. Israel will be safe, secure, Jewish, and democratic state today, tomorrow, and forever. May God protect all those who work for peace. God save those who are still in harm's way. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. President, what is your red line that would prompt U.S. military involvement in this war? President Biden in Israel making remarks, obviously, on the world stage, not taking questions there uh, in the room, certainly uh, likely because...
And if you're just joining us now, we are coming out of a special report by ABC where President Biden was talking in Israel after meeting with families there. Uh, his single message, which he repeated several times, was uh, to Israel that you are not alone. Uh, there is, uh, he also said there is no rationalizing the attacks by Hamas. The president also says that they're going to make sure that Israel will be a safe place for uh, Jewish people. But he also mentioned that the Palestinian people there were suffering greatly as well. Yeah, the president not only declared his support for Israel during that speech, he indicated he believed it was not responsible for a Gaza hospital blast that Palestinian officials said killed hundreds. We're going to have much more in our later newscast, and of course, on ABC World News Tonight with David Muir later today. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It is 926. Looking out there with live cam, another pretty day. We are at a nice 59 degrees right now, and we know things are going to warm up, but not too bad. Yeah, we're loving this weather right now. It's been a good stretch, I will tell you. Uh, it's going to get much hotter. In fact, we could be flirting with some records by the time we get into Friday and Saturday. But let's enjoy this beautiful weather while we can. Let's look at the time lapse here uh, over the last several hours. Beautiful sunrise. And right now we've got blue skies 57 at the airport. 57 in New Braunfels, 55 in Sakeen, 61 Bernie. These numbers are on their way up. It will be a warm afternoon, but the first half of the day is going to be another gorgeous start. Uh, 83, the forecast on Canyon Lake today, 84 New Braunfels, 84 Pleasanton, 83 in Divine, 83 again here in town. Not bad, not bad, but as we go forward, look at the highs the next few days. Friday, 94. That would be a record. Last set in uh, 1979, the record's 92. So I think that's in jeopardy. And I know you're thinking, man, we, we are supposed to be done with this heat. Well, it comes back briefly. At least it's just a couple days. I think after that, it does start to cool down again. But know that Friday and the first half of the weekend are going to be very toasty. We do have a front that we're watching. Right now, it's up across north Texas. Does it bring us rain? No. Does it cool us down? As you saw, absolutely not. All it does is draw in some drier air, so the dew points will fall off as we get into tomorrow afternoon. So this really isn't much to worry about. Uh, now, before it gets here, we will see moisture briefly come back into play tomorrow morning. You'll feel it a little bit more. It could result in a little bit of patchy fog, and this model does show some fog developing. Again, briefly tomorrow morning. Shouldn't be a big, big issue, but I do want to let you know that that is a possibility. As we look at the dew points, they're still pretty low right now, so they rise overnight. And then by tomorrow morning, we get some muggy conditions, and that's why I think we could see a little bit of fog. Then that front comes through, and then the dew points fall off again, and we're back into the dry air. Hey, we got to talk about the Pacific because this is potentially our next weather maker. We're watching Norma out here in the Pacific. Of course, here's the west coast of Mexico. And right now, Norma. Just a tropical storm, winds are at 65 miles per hour, gusting to 75. It's moving northwest at about 7 miles per hour, and it will slowly move north towards Cabo before making a turn to the northeast. It will become a hurricane, we think. The question becomes, how could this affect our weather? Well, this is the time of year where some of that moisture can get pulled up into South Texas, and it looks like that's possible next week. This is one of our computer models, and it does show Pacific moisture streaming into South Texas by, say, Tuesday into Wednesday. Now, at this point, I don't think this is going to be a huge rainmaker for us. And it's hard to say exactly when and where we'll see some of this rain. But I think by midweek, a uh, possibility that rain returns to the forecast. And with cloud cover, that'll cool us down some, too. So something to watch for next week. In the meantime, again, pretty quiet. 88 tomorrow, 94 Friday. 92 Saturday. We start to increase the clouds as some of that Pacific moisture comes in and we will add in some rain chances Monday and Tuesday. Right now 20% Monday, 30% Tuesday. And uh, overnight lows, whether well, back in the 60s and 70s, we were enjoying these 40s and 50s. Yeah. Gone for now. All right. Still nice overall. Not bad. Not bad. Thank yeah. you, Justin. All right. Because of ABC's special report, we're kind of moving things around in this broadcast. That's right. For now, we're going to look at today's night at nine. President Biden had his high stakes meeting with Israel's prime minister today, but his talks with Arab leaders were called off. The cancellation comes after the Gaza Health Ministry reports at least 500 Palestinian civilians were killed when a rocket hit a hospital. During his meeting, Biden told the Israeli leader that the bombing, quote, appears to be done by the other team, not you, end quote. The number of dead from the conflict rising to more than 4,000, including at least 31 Americans. 
Those on the ground warn that nowhere is safe from the relentless Israeli airstrikes and the rapidly deteriorating humanitarian situation. Republican Representative Jim Jordan has a second vote for House Speaker scheduled for this morning after the first attempt to win the position failed yesterday. 20 Republicans voted against him, and in order to win, he can only afford to lose four GOP votes if all Democrats are present. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries says his caucus is in talks to reopen the House with, quote, traditional Republicans, end quote. Paying with a debit card may not cost the store quite as much soon. The Federal Reserve is working on a proposal to cut debit card fees. Right now, every transaction costs the store 21 cents plus 0.05% of the bill. Despite higher prices and higher interest rates, Americans stepped up spending in September. Retail sales are up 0.7% according to the Commerce Department. That's more than twice expectations. The increase was driven by spending online and at restaurants. Holiday spending will likely rebound to and even surpass pre-pandemic levels this year for the first time. That prediction comes from a new report from Deloitte Consulting. But according to that report, it's not gifts that people will be splurging on the most. It's splurging on themselves and prioritizing non-gift purchases such as decorations. The IRS is moving ahead with a plan to build its own free tax filing program. Direct File is a pilot version that will be available to some taxpayers in 13 states next year, including here in Texas. Eventually, the IRS tax filing system could serve as an alternative to private tax preparation companies like H&R Block and TurboTax. A new charge on the site formerly known as Twitter X has launched what's called the Not A Bot program. The subscription service charges new users $1 per year to post on the site. It's being tested right now in New Zealand and the Philippines. PayPal has launched a package tracking feature on its app. It allows users to see the status of their online orders, whether you paid with PayPal or not. The free feature can be used through a Gmail account linked to PayPal or by typing in the tracking information. And that's today's Nine at Nine. We are back at 936 today. Science with Sarah is taking on a bit of a Halloween twist. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Sarah Spivey and David Sears are out at Baskin Elementary this morning with a group of second graders making magnetic spider webs. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Yes, we are making magnetic spider webs with these awesome second graders. Here's what you is need. That what, is that David's already works? gotten a heads up here, head start. He made his spiky spider <laughs> out of cardboard paper. You need googly eyes. And now on a piece of paper, and I prefer the non-coated ones because you can draw on them with markers, you're going to make a spider web. So make a spider web, David. Ooh, that's very square. Wow. That spider must have not been too happy, huh? <laughs> when he made that <laughs> web. Spider. Okay, good job. Uh, all Easy right. To attract food. And then on the back of your spider, you're gonna tape a magnet like that. And then you're gonna make a magnetic wand, ooh, by taping magnets on there. How come we didn't eat the popsicle before we ate the popsicle? Uh, you stick? know what? We missed out, man. We should have eaten the should've, popsicle. Should've and then you can either use the connecting side to make your spider do cool tricks. Ooh. Or you can use the repelling side to make it bounce and stuff like that. So it's super fun. This teaches them about magnets. Now these kids have been working so hard. Guys, show the camera your spiders. That is so cool. I love all of the spookiness. All right, Sebastian, you ready to talk to me? What makes the spider move around? It's the magnets because uh oh. <laughs> Look, it's stuck to the stuck to the chair. What made the spider move? Because these, the, this one's the west and this one's on the north, and it makes it stick. But but if it's both, it repels off. So like that. So they won't stick. So opposites attract. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. You see, these kids learned about magnets today, and they learned about spiders. What's your spider's name, sweetie? Spooky. Spooky. See, that's a great name for a spider because it's Halloween. Why does the spider move around the plate when you stick the two maggots together? Because the spider. Because um, it's. Because um, it's. 
it's south and north, and south and north stick together, exactly. and they don't repel it. Exactly. Let's move it around. See if you can make it scary. Can your spider be scary? Mine can. We just had them glowing in the dark. You can? What's your spider's name? Spookily. Spooky. Spooky, too? We got two spooky spiders? All right, so what makes it move? Uh, the one right here in the back. The uh -huh. secret one, and they can move. So they're so the the opposite attract. So what if you turn the the stick over? What happens? It won't work because they both can. Oh. Ah, so you just fell on the floor. Mm -hmm. Spider got away. It won't connect. It won't connect anymore. All right. They also learn from science with Sarah what sticks to magnets and what doesn't stick to magnets. Do y'all remember what your magnet? Uh, what else your magnet will stick to? What will it stick to? Metal. What it will it stick to glass? No. Will it stick to plastic? No. But it'll stick to some metals, right? Yeah. And it'll stick to each other. What's your spider's name? Uh, Miss. What Mr. is it? Skinny legs. Skinny legs. I love that, I love one. that one. And tell me, tell me about the the magnet and and how much fun it is to watch this magnet work. Uh, is it fun to watch it work? Can you make it jump? Like if you try, can Spin you guys it. make it jump? Spin your magnet. With the repelling side? Good job! Second graders are pretty smart, guys. And what's your name? What's your name? Anaya. And what is your spider's name? Um, Do you have one yet? Is it spider? Okay, and they're stuck together. Make a move. Can you make it move around? So, second graders, was this a fun experience? Spider got away. I got him back. Everybody wave around your spiders and say bye to your parents. Hi to your parents. Hi. Uh, woo. Back to you guys. Oh, that was a Super perfect pre-Halloween uh, experiment. Yeah, I love it. I bye, love all guys. The all the yeah. second graders out there at Baskin Elementary. Yeah, getting ready for Halloween. Thank you, guys. Time Nine, now? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. 940. 61 <laughs> degrees. We'll be, we'll right, be right back. back. Well, we here at KSAT are always trying to find ways to connect with our community and find better ways to serve our community. So today, we're kicking off a new multi-platform project called Know My Neighborhood. So it's going to focus on different neighborhoods around the city. And joining us this morning is our Steve Spreester. Hey. What? Yeah, thanks for joining I us. Have, I'm happy to be with <laughs> you guys. And I got to learn about magnetic spiders and all kinds of stuff. I so I, I'm really excited about this project. I am too. So talk, talk a little bit about this project and how it was born. It was born three years ago. We did a presentation with uh, some of the neighborhood associations about a, a polling thing that we did called Bear Facts, where we would pull issues. We asked them what their major issues were. And neighborhood by neighborhood, whether it was north, south, east, west, they cared about public safety, they cared about taxes, property taxes especially, and roads but they each had their own twist on the different issues that they had in their neighborhoods. And so that's what led me to the idea of why don't we talk to some of these neighborhood associations, go to neighbors and talk about what affects their lives. Not politicians, not elected officials, we're talking to neighbors about what matters to them in their neighborhoods. And so we're starting with Westwood Square tonight mm -hmm. And it is a neighborhood that's boundaries are Highway 90, there you get a good idea. Castroville Road, Soralvo, 151. We are actually going live tonight at six o'clock from Tacos El Rey on Castroville Road. And when I talk about the major issues that each of these neighborhoods have, in Westwood Square, one of the major issues is they have a pedestrian bridge. You might remember about eight months ago, it was hit by a construction truck, the pedestrian bridge collapsed. The city just has left two ramps there that go to nowhere. Oh. I mean, you've heard the road to nowhere, they have ramps that go to nowhere. They're still there. They basically cleaned up the roadway and left it the way they were. <clears throat> and it's made a pedestrian, a dangerous pedestrian situation even more dangerous. And in that area, I guess that's a high volume pedestrian area. I mean, it's what, what you're hearing so far. It's also, a, it's an old roadway, Castroville Road. So you are, the, the sidewalks are narrow. You are right by the road. I mean, you make one misstep and you're in the road and traffic is, there's not a lot of traffic lights, not a lot of pedestrian crossings there. That's why they built the bridge in the first place. So now you've got that on top of everything else. 
Yeah, I love our call letters, KSAT, because SA literally is our, yeah. our middle name, and now we get to prove it with a series like this. If we could take just a moment, we want to show everybody the trailer of uh, episode yes. one of Know My Neighborhood. There's a lot of beautiful people out here that call this home. Oh, I love it, been here forever, I'll probably die here. <laughs> our neighbors keep an eye on our houses and they make sure that we're safe. There's a lot of traffic and going all over the place. The street remains very dangerous to cross. Kind of a food desert, you know, uh, that's the other thing. There's really not a lot of uh, grocery stores. Break-ins, burglaries, a lot of gun violence too. Uh, it's changing for the better. There's a very strong family uh, commitment within this community. The moment that you're involved with a player, you, you get introduced to their entire family. Is one of the strength of Westwood Square the people who live here? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, again tonight uh, on, the, uh, on the evening newscast. Yeah, and it, it, we're going to do one of these a month. Yeah, we're going to start. I was going to say this Westwood isn't just Square. a one this shot. This is not yeah. a one shot deal. No, yeah. we've we've already got the first four set up. We're going to Westwood Square, then we're going to go to Alamo Ranch, then we're going to go to Dingwoody Hill, and then we're going to Monte Viejo, which is down by Brooks. Wow, and a lot of those places have huge growth right now. Well, and, and different issues. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about growing pains when you're yeah. talking about, uh, you know, when you're talking about Alamo Ranch. When you're talking about Westwood Square, you're talking about one of the city's oldest neighborhoods Absolutely. that feels forgotten. And one of their complaints, their local grocery store. Oh, so yeah, we, I saw we, the, we, the food desert. We, yeah. we also checked out the shelves and found some surprising things on some of the shelves in the in the neighborhood, and that's also part of the stories that we're doing. Spree, thanks for coming in today. Hey, it's great to see you guys. Good to see you Anytime. too. Anytime. Yes. Love the glasses, by the way. I'm yes. going for the Mark Austin look. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a good look for you as well. <laughs> good luck out there, dude. Break a leg. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, guys. Enjoy. Yes. Thanks for coming. Have in. good weather for it. Yeah, Absolutely. it's gonna be beautiful. Yes, it's a perfect day to get outside and anchor a newscast or go have lunch outside. Here's Justin. Yeah, it sure is. Temperatures are still making their way up into the 60s. Real quick, before we get into the forecast, we got to show you the skeleton family. Uh, I think you probably saw this this morning, but this is pretty incredible. Uh, Miley Skolris. <laughs> uh, there, if you remember, what was it? Wrecking Ball, right? That was the, uh, that was the yeah, song. 2013. Oh, wow. Okay. Steph coming with the date. I like it. Uh, but anyway, great job. I love the creativity. They, they keep coming up with something incredible every time. So we'll see what's uh, what we got a little bit later this week. Noon time today, 73 sunny. We're up around 83 this afternoon. Southerly winds start to kick in. You know what southerly wind usually means for us, and that's a little more humidity. You probably won't notice it so much today, but maybe tomorrow morning, a little bit more humidity in the air, and that could lead to some patchy fog. Right now, 57 at the airport. Dew point is at 45. West northwesterly winds at about 3. And we are watching a frontal boundary. This comes in tomorrow. So this is tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. We're still out ahead of that boundary, which is why I think we see a little bit of that patchy fog I mentioned, but then the dry air punches back in and we're back into low humidity. So any humidity we see over the next 24 hours will be short lived uh, and it'll get out of here. And you can see that here in the dew point forecast that uh, it climbs into tomorrow morning and then falls off pretty quickly by tomorrow afternoon once that front comes through. Satellite picture shows we've still got perfectly clear skies. There are clouds out in the Gulf of Mexico, an indication that there is some moisture sitting out there waiting to move back in, waiting to move on shore. In the water vapor imagery, which shows us where the moisture is, and it doesn't really show a whole lot, honestly. We've got that front that's working south, so we're watching that. A little spin out west, but this stays out west, at least for now. And then we look down to the south and west, and yeah, there's a lot of moisture there. This is a Pacific system that is looking better and better. This is Norma. Tropical storm likely becomes a hurricane here soon. You can just see the satellite presentation here. It looks very healthy. And right now, winds are at 65 miles per hour, gusting to 75. It's moving northwest at about 7 miles per hour. Why do we care about this? Well, it could bring us some rain, potentially, as we get into next week. It slowly moves north, strengthens a little bit before weakening as it moves towards the west coast of Mexico. As it moves inland, some of that moisture could get pulled up into South Texas. We see that uh, often in the month of October. Uh, we look to the Pacific to bring us some moisture and some rain chances, but I think this is a possibility as we get into next week. Now, I don't think rain chances are going to be just huge here. I don't think we're going to get a ton of rain out of this, but with some Pacific moisture around Tuesday and Wednesday, we do add in some rain chances to our forecast and we could see some showers and maybe a couple storms. Something to watch. Extended forecast.
88 Thursday, 94 Friday. 94, by the way, on Friday would be a record high. We may tie a record high on Saturday. More clouds, though, as that Pacific moisture moves in and some small rain chances Monday and Tuesday. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. It's 954. We're going to look out there with Zoo Cam. I'm looking for the whooping crane. This is the camera for that, but I don't I don't see them out there today. Do you they're, see them? We decided they're bashful <laughs> when we are here. Yeah. When we have substitutes. They come out. Cranes all day. Is well, that is that wait, one? Wait, wait, what, what, oh, there what? was maybe oh, one. Okay. 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 Well, now it's hiding again. <laughs> well, it was great to go to the zoo. Thank you all the hard working <laughs> staff out there at the zoo. Yeah. And the cranes are apparently on strike. Yes. All right. A little <laughs> sports mention this morning. Tonight is game three of the ALCS between the Rangers and the Astros. Stros hoping to get a win on the road after losing those first two home games over at Minute Maid. First pitch happens at 7.03 p.m. Spurs back on the court tonight for another preseason game against the Rockets. And while Wemby didn't play last night, reports are he's supposed to play tonight. Mm. Tips up for 7 o'clock at the Frost Bank Center. Very nice. Well, Halloween is creeping up on us. And according to Google, the most popular costume right now is Barbie. Barbie, duh. The dolls come in all sorts of outfits, so a variety of costumes are available. That's right. We are told that Princess is a number two pick based on what Google calls its Fright Geist Spider-Man takes third. Other popular outfits include the traditional witch, the cowboy, or the ninja. And in a cross-holiday quirk, the tenth most popular costume is a bunny. The bunny. Can't go wrong with the bunny. That's, That's interesting. Adorable. No big surprise about Barbie. No. Yeah, we knew that was gonna gonna be there. I'm surprised my little girl didn't want to do it, but I don't know. You're That's going okay. as Ken this year, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Have a good no, day. not happening.